Cross it. Hey everybody, Dr. O here. Welcome to chapter 15. So we're beginning these next three chapters as a little unit on life cycle nutrition. So I think it's the next three chapters, yeah. Uh, we're going to focus on pregnancy and lactation here, and then infancy, childhood, into adolescence in the next one. And then we'll look at nutrition for aging populations in chapter 17. So... Uh, all right, so pregnancy and lactation, obviously huge deals. I mean, think about how important. Uh, I always tell students that the, the nine most important months of your life were the nine months you were in your mother's womb. And you can make an argument that the 10th most important month is the month before you were conceived because the nutritional status of your parents impacts um, everything from the from the health of the gametes to you you know you developing I mean you, your mother is basically the environment that you develop in so uh, clearly nutritional status uh, during pregnancy is going to play a big role in helping you reach your genetic limits or your genetic capabilities basically and then we'll look at lactation and, and breast milk I, I really like to talk about that topic it's actually one of my favorite topics because um, we look at uh, from an immunity standpoint the importance of, of breast milk and of course nutrition nutritional quality but the the vitamins and minerals and things like that that you find in breast milk, they can be reproduced more with formula. But um, if you look at the uh, the immunity aspect of it and the fact that uh, breast milk is loaded with material that's designed to enhance and build your baby's microbiome, certainly one of my favorite topics. But of course, never any condemnation from me, right? I, I, I think that uh, breast milk is the is the best choice when possible, but I also know it's not always possible. And I know, you know, even in... in in our lives with uh, with Oliver that you know my wife is not able to uh, breastfeed near as long or as much as we had hoped so sometimes it's completely out of your control all right uh, let's go ahead and dive in so the icebreaker what is the relationship between what is consumed before and during pregnancy and the genetically defined limits of a newborn well, again that's a, that's a huge topic but uh, um, I think it makes sense that um, you need you need to uh, be as healthy as possible prior to becoming pregnant and then after getting pregnant. And then, of course, even with males, we'll look at the how nutrition and health impact the quality of sperm. So if you have you know the highest quality sperm and the highest quality egg and then a great environment for, for that uh, baby to grow up in, then you will hopefully reach those genetic limits. Like I said, get, get as healthy as you, you potentially can. Um, does this change as they grow? I mean, I think I, I think that you, when you're young, I mean, nutrition is critically important, right? For me, you know, as a 44 year old man, I'm basically maintaining, right? I'm trying to maintain my brain health. I'm trying to basically slow the decline of my brain health. Um, you know, I'm trying I'm trying to stay as strong as possible and all these types of things. But uh, but when you're young and you're you're growing and building, it's even more critically important. When I look at, um, <clears throat> I mean, just anything, right? When I think about my son Oliver's brain, you know, he's seven, almost eight now. His, you know, his brain is literally being built um, out of the building blocks that come from his food, right? So I, so I think that nutrition is important for every age, but uh, during during development, so in, in your mother's womb and those first few years of your life, it, it is the most critically important time. And then even from a micro bi microbiome standpoint, a microbiological standpoint, right? Your adult microbiome is basically um, built by the by the age of three, which means that um, things that happen in those first three years of your life, um, from from delivery onward um, can have an impact on your microbiome that will that will persist forever right if i if i take antibiotics now as a 44 year old man um, it will have an impact on my microbiome but imagine needing antibiotics when you're two or three months year old or one year old um, that can literally have an impact forever so all these so nutrition always matters but i think that it's a, even more important when you're building something right it's a lot easier for us to maintain our house now that it's built but when it was being built the the, the better quality ingredients and materials that you use to build this house will be what maintains it for hopefully decades to come just like just like our our internal houses as well uh okay and yeah so many things we talk about there right i mean the, the healthier your bones are when you're young uh, the more bone, bone you can afford to lose as you age and the, the more muscle you have when you're young the more muscle you can afford to lose as you age right you don't want these things to happen but but i think you get the point all right uh, the learning objectives for this chapter list the ways men and women can prepare for a healthy pregnancy so it is not just uh, women you look at you know many traditional cultures i mean pretty much all traditional cultures that i've ever studied had special pre-pregnancy nutrition um, rituals and routines for women but some of the cultures also had special pre-pregnancy nutrition for men and i think and i think it makes sense all right uh, describe fetal development from conception to birth and explain how maternal malnutrition can affect critical periods so we'll talk about what critical periods are and then how uh, malnutrition can can have uh, devastating impacts and impacts that are permanent 
explain how both being underweight or overweight can interfere with a healthy pregnancy, and how weight gain and physical activity can support maternal health and infant growth. So we'll look at like how much weight um, someone should gain during pregnancy and what the benefits are of that, etc. Four, summarize the nutrient needs of women during pregnancy. So how, does, how do nutrient needs change? Uh, identify factors predicting low risk and high risk pregnancies and describe ways to manage them. And then summarize the nutrient needs of women during lactation. So the needs during pregnancy and lactation are different and unique. Okay, nutrition prior to pregnancy. Um, nutrition can affect fertility, um, risks with being both overweight or underweight. And I think that's that's the case for, for both men and women, but obviously um, we're mainly talking about, about females here, but uh, uh, you know, the the healthier a male is, the healthier their their sperm are, right? So if you if you're malnourished or and you're overweight and you're inflamed and all the and all these types of things, then you're um, you're more likely to have a pretty large percentage of your sperm that are non-motile, maybe not moving, or they're non-functional, right? So and this is something that's a pretty serious issue. Um, your sperm count may also be lower. So so that if a male is healthy and taking care of themselves and not not malnourished, um, not only will their sperm be healthier, but there should be more of them and they should be more functional. Ones. Ones, meaning that you're more likely to conceive. Um, so with with females though, both the so if you're overweight, you see um, that how that can impact sex hormone levels quite a bit. And if you're underweight, remember that uh, your you know your your adipose tissue, your body fat, basically sends signals to your brain about how much stored energy you have um, using a hormone leptin. Well, leptin can have a direct impact on the gonadotropins or or, or a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone. Um, which will impact uh, the the main gonadotropins, which they're called that because they impact the gonads. So the gonadotropins are follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, and they impact the production of your sex hormones and your sex cells, your gametes. So if you're underweight, your brain is basically getting the signal that now is not a good time to conceive because if you don't have enough stored energy for you to survive, then now is definitely not time to be building another human being and bringing them into this this world. Uh, so this is why you see with people that get extremely lean, uh, maybe female bodybuilders or or ath you know athletes involved in in sports like gymnastics, you see that they their body fat levels can get so low that they um, lose their menstrual cycle. It's called amenorrhea, and that's quite common when people get um, overly lean. So you do need you need a, you need a certain amount of body weight and body fat to support a healthy pregnancy. So being overweight makes you inflamed and impacts hormone levels and hormone signaling. Being underweight um, impacts impacts the production of sex hormones and the the odds that you will become pregnant. If anything, I guess if you had, if you asked me, I would say that in you know in the month uh, month or two prior to getting pregnant, you know if you maybe gained a couple of pounds, it might send um, stronger signals to your body that um, reproduction is a is is a go than if you were to lose a couple pounds. So, but that obviously depends on the weight you're at when you're when you're starting. All right, so preparation before pregnancy. I mentioned this several times with some of the nutrients, like if you can become pregnant, you should already be eating like you are because as you'll see in a little bit here, many of the critical periods um, in, in your baby's development are gonna happen very early, right? Think about uh, basically the, you know, in the first um, six, seven, eight weeks tops, um, after becoming pregnant, that's when a child will develop neural tube defects. Well, you often don't know you're pregnant. I've had students that said they didn't even know they were pregnant for eight, nine, ten weeks. So uh, it's too late to start taking a folate supplement if, it, if you've already passed these critical periods where the neural tube is developing. So if you can become pregnant, you should already be thinking about these types of things. And we all know where babies come from. So, All right, uh, preparation before pregnancy. Achieve and maintain a healthy body weight. So if you're overweight, uh, trying to get to a better, better body weight, uh, through diet and exercise. If you're underweight, you know, trying to add a little bit of weight make a lot of sense. I think this is this is why you see that um, you know people that make positive lifestyle changes like changing their diet and exercising, they often do see an increase uh, odds of of fertility. Choose an adequate and balanced diet, and you know, making sure you have all the nutrients you need for yourself. You know, uh, whether it's for the production of the gametes, the sex cells, or if it's for you know being healthy for because you're the environment and you're where the baby is going to um, get their nutrients. If you if you're the female, uh, be physically active. That impacts hormone signaling, single signaling, and controls inflammation. All positive things. Uh, receive regular medical care. You want to make sure you don't have hypertension or high blood sugar, right? Or, or um, diabetes, these kind of things. Uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is the leading cause of infertility in the United States. You want to get these things dealt with uh, to make it more likely that you will become pregnant and to make it more likely that you have a, you have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby.
Uh, manage chronic conditions. Again, you have chronic inflammatory conditions or whatever underlying conditions you have. If you help deal with them, you, you will be healthier. And avoid harmful influences, things that could negatively impact a pregnancy, one that you don't, whether you know it's there or not, at the, you know, like alcohol and drugs, those kind of things. We'll cover that at the end. All right, reflection number one, you can feel free to pause this and, and match these. Uh, the met a metabolically active organ, that's the placenta. So the placenta basically is a temporary organ that develops during pregnancy, and that's, that's going to be um, the main connection between mom and baby. Contains fetal blood vessels extending through the placenta. That'd be the umbilical cord. That's how the baby gets fed. I like to think about, you know, I've, I've heard the, uh, the, a baby called a perfect parasite before, right? It's basically, uh, you know, it's, it's an organism living inside of you that's half you genetically, but not, not all you. So that's, you know, there are some concerns there with your immune system recognizing this thing, and, you know, this baby as foreign. Um, but then babies are generally really good at getting the nutrients they need. Like, for example, um, fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than regular hemoglobin. So babies are going to get the oxygen they need. Um, babies are going to get the nutrients they need. So basically, if mom is well nourished, then everything's good. But if mom is poorly nourished, um, the baby's going to extract whatever nutrients it needs generally. You know, the baby seems to take priority, which, which it should. So uh, a pregnancy can be very hard on mom, right? And that's where you have issues with um, uh, making sure you're properly nourished before you get pregnant, uh, during pregnancy, uh, and then after pregnancy, right? The next you know, thing is, if you have a baby, when are you going to have the next baby? You know, and our ancestors, um, many cultures, they had, you know, they had strategies in place to try to, to try to space babies out to make sure that mom fully recovered um, from from delivering, you know, growing one human before they started growing another one. So, and some studies have shown that if children are born, you know, if a, if, a, if a mother has three or four kids right in a row, that, you know, the third and fourth kid are more likely to have some problems, whether it's immune system problems or, or different health problems. And it could be that mom's nutrient stores have just been tapped out. All right, um, embedded in the uterine wall, that's the placenta. Fluid-filled structure that houses the developing fetus. That's the amniotic sac with full of amniotic fluid. It exchanges oxygen, nutrients, and waste. That's the placenta. Remember that organ that connects mother and baby. Growth, so just back to what we're talking about, just making, you know, getting as healthy as possible, you know, prior to making the sperm and egg that are used uh, um, for fertilization will not only increase your chances of having a baby, but will give them the healthiest start possible. And that's what I said before when I said the 10th most important month of your life was the month before, you know, your, your mother and father conceived you. Growth and development during pregnancy now. All right, so the placental, placental and fetal growth and development. So the placenta develops right in the uterus. Uh, the amniotic sac, sac is what houses the fetus, and it's full of the amniotic fluid. And the umbilical cord contains the, blood, the fetal blood vessels that connect mom and baby. That's how the baby, remember, the baby isn't breathing, right? The, ba you know, the baby isn't um, eating, right? So it's getting all of its nutrients, all of its oxygen from mother and, and delivering all the waste products uh, back to mom and through mom. Fetal growth and development, we start with uh, the uh, the ovum or the oocyte or the egg and sperm. So those are, those are the gametes. They both have one set of chromosomes or 23 chromosomes. And then um, a fertilized egg would be, would be called a zygote. So once that sperm and egg come together, a zygote is a single cell that divides to become what's called a blastocyst. So for about a half an hour, you were, you know, give or take, you were a fertilized egg. And then you were two cells and four cells and eight cells. And, and all these cells had the ability to become an entire you, right, entire human being. But then as these rounds and rounds of cell divisions continued, cells started to travel down paths. This is what you learn in embryology classes. They traveled down paths where they decided what kind of cell they were going to be. Like, oh, I'm going to become part of the liver. I'm going to become part of the brain. That's what happens. Uh, so, but, at that, but when you have that single cell, that fertilized egg, that zygote, um, that cell has all the instructions to make any part of you. So pretty cool. All right, and then we have that cluster of cells. Implantation is when it implants in the uterus and, and where it's going to stay uh, and develop into a baby. And then we have the embryo uh, into a fetus. So you, you start as that single cell. Uh, the, the embryo becomes a fetus at eight weeks. The stages of embryonic and fetal development. So we can look at these here. Um, a zygote is a newly fertilized egg or ovum and is about the size of the period at the end of this sentence. Less than one week after fertilization, cells have rapidly divided to become a blastocyst ready for implantation, which you see up in that picture. 
Uh, so fertilization usually takes place in the uterine tube or the fallopian tube, and then as this cluster of cells starts to divide, it's traveling towards the uterus where it should implant. So after implantation, the placenta develops and begins to provide nourishment for the developing embryo. This is an embryo that's five weeks old. After fertilization, is about half an inch long. Uh, a little, a little peanut there. A fetus after, so here we see after 11 weeks of development is just over an inch long. Notice the umbilical cord and blood vessels connecting the fetus with the placenta. So that's that lifeline between mom and baby. A newborn infant after nine months of development measures close to 20 inches in length. From eight weeks to term, this infant grew 20 times longer and 50 times heavier. So, uh, so speaking of healthy, if the you know, baby just born, uh, a he healthy weight uh, for a baby is generally going to be in the six and a half to eight pound range. Obviously, some kids are smaller, some are larger, but that's kind of what you what the ideal that you'd like to see. I know Oliver; he was not quite six pounds, so he was he was no no he was. He was almost seven pounds, actually. Sorry, I was not quite six pounds. So I've made up for it since then, but uh, I was not quite six pounds when I was born. Okay, uh, the placenta and its associated structures. So again, you just see the placenta is this connection. Um, it's where the uh, it's where the umbilical cord arises and heads into the amniotic uh, sac, and that's that lifeline between mom and baby. So all the oxygen and nutrients the baby needs is coming. Um, from you know from mom to baby and then all the carbon dioxide and waste products is coming back so pretty cool all right and then the, yeah the placenta is it basically is a temporary endocrine organ it's a temporary organ that is that is delivered you know with the afterbirth after after delivery all right reflection you can feel free to pause and try to answer these Implants in the uterine wall after one week, that's called a blastocyst. Uh, two to eight weeks after conception, we have the embryo. Uh, new, newly fertilized ovum is called a zygote. And then from eight weeks on, grows until birth, that's the, that's the fetus. All right, critical period. So these are very important and many of them are very early in the process because a critical period, I'll read the, I'll read the, the definition they give here. Times of intense development and rapid cell division. So cellular, here's the key. Cellular activities can occur only during these times. So if you miss a critical period or if you, you don't have the nutrients needed during a critical period, you can't undo that. So you see here over on this right-hand side, uh, the first half, an adverse influence experienced early in pregnancy permanently impairs fetal development and a full recovery never occurs. That's why it's called a critical period. Whereas here in the green bar, you see an adverse influence experienced late in pregnancy temporarily impairs fetal development, but a full recovery is possible. Not guaranteeing it, but it is possible. So that's why these critical periods are so important. Uh, and this is why I always say that if you can become pregnant, you need to act as if you are. Because look at the, I mean, you see the critical, pe critical periods are so early on in the process that you will probably not even know you're pregnant. And so if you're, if you're missing, you know, key nutrients or you're consuming alcohol, you're doing these kind of things, um, they, can, they can leave a permanent impact on your baby. Okay, uh, excuse me, take a drink here quick. So damage during these critical periods has permanent consequences for the fetus's life and health. A uh, good example, the best example, critical period for neural tube development is between 17 and 30 days of gestation. So you often will not know you're pregnant in between 17 and 30 days. So if you didn't have enough folic acid or folate on board, then there's no way to undo a neural tube defect if it has occurred. All right, so here's, here, here's these, these critical periods. You're looking at weeks of gestation. Notice that the first thing de that develops is the central nervous system. So being, being malnourished or exposed to things like alcohol or drugs in those first few weeks is going to have the largest impact on the, the central nervous system, like your brain and spinal cord. Uh, then you see the heart, ears, eyes, legs and arm, teeth, palate, and external genitalia. So if you're, and, and none, all of these things are occurring in the first 12 weeks. So these critical periods, all of them have occurred in the first three months, but look at how many of them have started, have occurred or started to occur in the first four weeks, which it's, it's almost rare to know you're pregnant in the first four weeks. So this is why I just continually say, you know, make, make sure that um, you're, I would say, if you can become pregnant, at, at least be taking a prenatal vitamin. Right, and you know, and just be be focusing on being healthy. But that's like that to me. That's the the least you should be doing, uh, just in case. All right, anything else about these? Uh, you, see, you do see the central nervous system develops first. That's why the neural tube develops um, right away at the beginning, and. Um, there's a, there's a book called The First Thousand Days that's good, but I mean, it's terrifying, but it talks about malnutrition, you know, d during pregnancy and how it, it, 
uh, pregnancy and then the first thousand days of life after birth, how um, if you don't have the nutrients you need for brain development, you don't have the calories and the fats and all the nutrients you need, then you will the, the brain will permanently be smaller and, the, and that will lead to permanent problems, right? So I, I give a presentation on on uh, malnutrition and the developing brain and, and it's really, really sad, you know, the research I've done, but um, these, th these things have generational impacts. So if you're malnourished while your child's brain's developing, they will never reach their potential, right? They, they Think about all the untapped potential that they will never be able to reach, which then means that that's gonna impact their ability to take care of their family and, and make money and these kind of things, which means that that cycle will probably continue. And this is especially true in the developing world. We'll look at global nutrition later, but if we can, if we can get mothers, right, get males too, but if you can get the females um, properly nourished be, prior to pregnancy and during pregnancy, that means that you can set that child on a completely different trajectory. So really, really important. All right, um, development issues during pregnancy. So we've talked about neural tube defects. A few examples here. Anencephaly is when the brain is either missing or fails to develop. Um, spina bifida is an incomplete closure of the spinal cord or that bo the bony vertebrae behind it. Uh, real, really minor issue like something called spina bifida occulta, where basically like the, the the back of the vertebrae might not fuse together completely. So you see a little tiny crack there, a little tiny gap. That's nothing compared to having exposed spinal cord. So there's there's different levels of 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 neural tube defects, but some are much uh, worse than others. I would say that, you know, in my career and looking at x-rays and stuff, somewhere in the ballpark of 10% of people had this real minor um, spina bifida stuff, but not, you know, not not the, um, the really, really um, disastrous developmental problems. Unknown causes, um, uh, but the, the main the main concern is getting folate on board, right? Making sure that um, that mom is is properly nourished, but especially with folate, because folate and B12 are so critically important for um, cell division and and development and differentiation. So uh, this is why pregnant women need 800 micrograms a day of folate compared to 400. Uh, you know, green leafy vegetables, lots of good food sources. Uh, take a prenatal vitamin. Like if you're already taking a multivitamin anyways, and you may possibly become pregnant, then I would I'd recommend switching to a pre needle vitamin. Just my recommendation, not medical advice. You'll notice I say that a lot. All right. Um, this is also why folate's been added to our food supply. So if you look at your good food sources of folate, you're going to see enriched grain products. So when you go to the store and you buy bread or really anything that has grains in it uh, for decades now, that those grains have been fortified where they've added folate to it to, to make sure that the average American's folate intake is high enough. And folate does more than prevent neural tube defects, but this is a huge deal, right? Prior to these fortification programs, uh, several thousand, maybe 3,000 or so um, children a year were born in the United States with, with neural tube defects, and that number has has dropped uh, drastically. So, all right, um, the developmental origins of disease. There's a lot to unpack here, but we'll just cover a few examples. Mother's nutrition may change gene expression in the fetus, and this can influence diseases of adulthood. I mean, absolutely, this is the an entire field of study called epigenetics, so EPI genetics. Epigenetics says that, okay, you can't change your genetic code. You can't change the A's and C's and G's and T's that you're made out of, but you can influence your genes, right? You can you can turn gene expression on or turn it off. You can speed up gene expression or slow it down. So mo mom's nutrition absolutely has an impact on how the genes operate in their developing baby. And here's why. We always talk about, well, simply put anyways, we always talk about uh, nature versus nurture, right? And how important your environment is. So you know that your env your environment is really important for your health. Well, the in your environment for nine months of your life was inside your mother's womb. So if mom was properly nourished, then you were getting, then, then, then signals were being sent to your body that you're entering a world where there's plenty of nutrition, right? If mom is malnourished, then you're getting signals as well, getting signals that there's famine and food's hard to come by. So you can see how, so you see here, malnutrition can increase the risk of type 2 diabetes. Well, that that could be because this baby's been getting signals for months that food's hard to come by. So when you find food, you should eat it, right? This baby's being hardwired for famine, even though it's not a real famine, right? Mom's malnourished because she's not getting enough nutrients because she's maybe eating a nutrient poor diet, but she's probably getting plenty of calories. So foods, food is plentiful usually, but if mom's malnourished, then the baby's getting signals that when you should, when you find food, you should eat it. When you find food, you should eat all of it. Um, when you eat food, you should store as much of it as fat as possible. And these all lead to this environment where a malnourished mom is more likely to have a, a kid that has type two diabetes, that is obese. Uh, they're more like, you know, their children are more likely to die before the age of 63, you know, things like that. So I think that, that, that one actually makes a lot of sense. 
Um, you see another example here, inadequate growth during placental and gestational development can affect blood pressure. So that's another, that's another example. But another one that's really good, and again, not good news, but let me, let me go back a point. So chronic diseases, adverse influences at critical times during fetal development can impact the baby into adulthood. We've said that. So another really good example would be stress, right? Some of these epigenetic studies were um, done on women that were in concentration camps during World War II while they were pregnant. Sorry, I was getting itchy nose. Um, so um, they were under extreme stress. They were malnourished too, but they were under extreme stress. And they found that basically the stress that mom had left an imprint on the baby. So these, these babies of mothers that were in concentration camps uh, while they were pregnant were, more li were hardwired for stress, more likely to be stressed out, more likely to have anxiety, uh, more likely to have schizophrenia, these kind of things. So early research in this area of epigenetics has shown that the, one of the reasons that mom's nutrition matters so much is mom is the environment Mom is the nurture, right? Is the environment that this baby is growing up in for the, for those nine months, and every day the baby's getting signals about what to expect in the world after delivery. So another reason to make sure that you're taking really good care of yourself. Like when, when my wife was pregnant, I mean, I I couldn't carry the baby, right? So but I but I told her that my you know my job was to do whatever I needed to do to make sure that she was as nourished as possible. You know, keeping her blood sugar stable because big swings in blood sugar appear to be one of the things that lead to this increased risk of diabetes. So I, my job was to try to make sure that my wife was really properly nourished and so so that my son was being taken care of. And then I told her, I said, let me let me handle the stress. Let me worry about the money and this and that. Like let me take take the stress on me. So it, it, I'm not putting it on you and the baby, right? She kind of joked too because she said, "Oh, don't worry, I can keep my blood sugar stable. I'll just keep it high all the time." Right? That was that was kind of our little joke. But uh, so you know, as the father, that's what I tried to do. Right? I tried to help um, help Oliver's environment as much as I could by taking care of my wife. You know, that's what I felt like my my job was. All right. Maternal weight, so weight gain. Should we gain weight? What's what is the weight gain? How much weight should you gain? All all things that depend on where you start. So weight, your weight prior to conception influences infant birth weight for sure. Uh, if you're underweight, uh, which generally you know could be seen as signs of malnutrition in some cases, um, higher rates of preterm births, so babies that are born too early and too small. Overweight and obesity, a higher rates of medical complications. You see a couple clear examples: gestational hypertension, so during pregnancy, blood pr high blood pressure, and gestational diabetes is a you know a temporary transient form of diabetes that develops during pregnancy. Both are bad. Both have a very negative impact on the baby, and both have a negative impact on mom. So, uh, so you don't want to be underweight uh, prior to conception. But if you're overweight, and especially if you're obese, there there's a lot of, there's a lot more risk here. Uh, more likely to have so macrosomia, so children above the 90th percentile, and an increased risk of cesarean delivery because the baby's too large to exit the birth canal. And that, from a we in microbiology, we talk about this a lot, but that that could have an impact on the baby too, because if a baby's born vaginally, then then they're seeded with mom's vaginal microbiome. If they have to be born via C-section, they are colonized by you know the quote unquote wrong microbes. So this, so not only would uh, you know being obese or overweight um, during pregnancy. Um, have an impact on the baby's health directly, but it also has an impact on the ecosystem that develops inside the baby too with the microbiome. So all important stuff. Um, what about that? Yeah, so so having diabetes, gestational diabetes, they definitely lead to larger children and that's, and that's where you see that increased risk of C-section or cesarean delivery. All right, weight gain during pregnancy. So you see the the question here is how much weight should be gained during pregnancy? Um, the answer is uh, depends on where uh, where you started, right? So um, so weight gain during pregnancy does impact fetal growth and maternal health, but it does depend on sufficient maternal weight gain. So so you do want to gain weight, even even if, even someone that's obese um, will be gaining weight. And it's not, it's not all fat, as you'll see, a lot of it's fluid, and of course it's the baby itself. Um, uh, the weight gain during pregnancy does correlate closely with infant birth weight, so it's a predictor of health and development. So not only do you wanna be the right body weight when you start, um, you wanna make sure that you, you gain an appropriate amount of weight during pregnancy. Uh, you should definitely not be trying to lose weight, for example, and, you sh and, you, and there's never a reason to need to gain uh, more weight than you need. You see here looking at, um, um, you know, even let's see, someone with a healthy weight having twins, they're they're never recommending gaining more than 54 pounds. All right, 
Uh, so recommended weight gains depends on the number of fetuses and your beginning weight. So let's go through this. If you're underweight with a BMI or body mass index below 18.5, um, for a single birth, uh, you would need, you, recommended weight gain is 28 to 40 pounds. If you started a healthy weight, BMI of 18.5 to 24.9, that number goes to 25 to 35 pounds. If you're overweight, notice that you need to gain less weight. You don't need, you know, because part of the weight gain, maybe seven pounds of it or so, is going to be fat. Well, if you already have excess body fat, you don't need to gain those pounds. You still need to gain the weight of the baby and the fluids and all that, but you don't need to gain that, that extra fat weight. Um, so overweight, uh, you see 15 to 25 pounds, and then obese with the BMI uh, of above 30, you see 11 to 20 pounds. And then with twins, you'd obviously want to gain more weight because there's two babies in there. Okay, so what is the weight gain that occurs during pregnancy? So here we see if we see a 30 pound weight gain, you see two pounds come from an increase in breast size because the glandular tissue is developing uh, it from the mammary glands so for, for lactation and the development and the production of breast milk. Um, four, increase in mother's fluid volume. So, you know, if you've been pregnant or know someone that has, you know, they start to, they can start to swell up, swollen ankles, these kind of things. Uh, one and a half pounds, the placenta, uh, four pounds, an increase in blood supply to the placenta. I mean, all body tissues need blood. So eating about a pound of fat might have seven miles of blood vessels in it or something like that. So you see, so you see an increase in blood supply. So more blood vessels, more blood. Uh, two of the pounds are amniotic fluid. Uh, seven and a half, give or take, is the baby at birth. Excuse me. And then two pounds, increase in size of the uterus and supporting muscles. The uterus gets, I mean, can grow up to 500 times its normal size. And then um, seven pounds is mother's necessary fat stores. So again, if you're already overweight or obese, that seven pounds would, would not really be um, needed. All right, let's look. Uh, go ahead and pause this, and then you can answer these questions, and we'll go and check them together. Uh, so as far as weight gain here, you see during the first trimester, you only a typical weight a recommended weight gain is only three and a half pounds. Let me go back a picture. You see, you haven't seen a couple. You haven't seen a lot of changes as far as needing to gain weight. The mammary glands haven't been developing. The uterus is still small, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So during the first trimester, only three and a half. That should be pounds, not uh, semicolon BS. <laughs> During the second and third trimester, you aim for about a pound a week. Um, increase in mother's fluid volume, four pounds. Uh, placenta, one and a half. And then seven pounds for those needed fat stores. Weight loss after pregnancy. So the, the, the return to pre-pregnancy weight depends on whether mother stayed within weight gain recommendations. So if, uh, if, you, if, if mom gained that 30 pounds, she's more likely to return to her pre-pregnancy weight. If she gained 40 or 50 pounds, way less likely to. Um, most women tend to retain a couple of pounds with each pregnancy. Uh, if you want to, uh, one of the best things you can do to... Uh, besides not gaining too much weight to begin with, but one of the things that you can do to increase your chances of returning to a pre-pregnancy weight by maybe even a couple hundred percent is uh, breastfeeding, is lactation. So that you, as you'll see, um, lactation costs about 500 calories a day. So you, you basically can put yourself in a 500 calorie a day deficit um, just by producing, producing ample amounts of breast milk. All right, uh, additional weight retention increase, increases the risk for diabetes, hypertension, and chronic diseases, just like any weight gain, right? If you, if you gain five to 10 pounds every pregnancy, well, then you, you now weigh more, and that puts you at higher risk categories for chronic diseases like diabetes and like high blood pressure or hypertension. All right, do's and don'ts of exercise during pregnancy. I kind of I like this. I thought this was a pretty good list, right? The the main key is um, it, when people have concerns about exercising during pregnancy, uh, the main concerns that I've heard, anyways, would be uh, core temperature climbing too high, right? Um, anything that would be kind of robbing the baby of blood supply. And then the fact that, especially in the third trimester of pregnancy, uh, you get, you know, there's, there's a hormone called relaxin and, and ligaments and soft tissue or you know, ligaments and connective tissues start to lack, uh, loosen up a little bit to prepare for delivery. So increased risk of injuring mom during that time. But, the, you know, obviously the key concerns would be, would be the baby, at least early on. So do, uh, let's look at the do's first. Begin to exercise gradually. You just you don't want to shock your body at this point. Um, exercise regularly, most if not all days of the week, like the recommendations we covered a chapter or two ago. Uh, do warm up with five to 10 minutes of light activity. You'll see most of these are just smart things everybody should do. Uh, do 30 minutes or more of moderate physical activity per day. Okay, we talked about that. Uh, do cool down with five to 10 minutes of slow activity and gentle stretching, all great. Do drink water before, during, and after exercise. We've covered that on two separate chapters now as far as hydration. Do eat enough 
to support the needs of pregnancy plus exercise. So if you're going to be burning 500 calories a day more with exercise, that's, that's a big number, but let's say you are, um, you can't let that rob the calories that your baby needs. So whatever, whatever your needs would be, uh, let, let's say you need 2,000 calories a day uh, during pregnancy. If you're going to be exercising and burning 500 more calories a day, then you need to be eating 2,500 calories a day. You are not trying to lose weight uh, during, during pregnancy. All right, and do rest adequately. Okay, the don'ts. Don't exercise vigorously after long periods of inactivity. Just don't want to don't want to hurt yourself. Don't uh, don't exercise in hot, humid weather. You, concerns about dehydration, uh, especially when you're pregnant. Don't exercise when sick with a fever. Your core temperature is already elevated. Uh, don't exercise while lying on your back after the first trimester of pregnancy, or stand motionless for prolonged periods. Just you know, looking at the health of the baby. Don't exercise if you experience any pain, discomfort, or fatigue. I guess that depends on what you mean by those things, right? Because uh, I feel pain and discomfort and fatigue every time I exercise, but uh, I don't know. Uh, don't participate in activities that may harm the abdomen or involve jerky, bouncy movements. No brainer. And no scuba diving because of the pressure changes and those types of things. All right, nutrition during pregnancy. Energy and nutrient needs during pregnancy. So uh, there are dramatic changes, especially during rapid periods of development of the baby. I mean, you're growing a human being, right? Think about that. Think about how the nutritional needs and the caloric needs in growing a human. I mean, that's, that's it's pretty amazing. All right, um, dramatic changes, guidelines for a healthy pregnancy, good nutrition, healthy rate of weight gain. We just covered those. Uh, physical activity, just covered that. Prenatal supplements, and we'll look at what, a, what what that means. You know, prenatal vitamins are basically the same as regular multivitamins. They just generally have more iron and more folic acid or folate. Avoid harmful substances. Um, obviously, like we'll talk about alcohol and, and, and fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, secondhand smoke can increase the risk of SIDS, you know, these kind of things. Um, Energy and nutrient needs are highest during pregnancy and lactation. You'll see that um, nutrient needs are actually higher, or energy needs, sorry, are higher during lactation than pregnancy. So these are, uh, so your your energy expenditure is going to be higher during pregnancy and lactation than any other time in your life because you're you're growing another human being, and then you're literally producing milk. All right. So to meet your needs, make careful selections. New, you know, nutrient dense foods, making sure you're getting enough calories but not too much. Uh, the body maximizes absorption and minimizes losses. So that's you know, I mean, it's like the the like I told you, the baby is is really designed to harvest whatever it needs. The mo mom is designed during these critical periods to to give the baby whatever it needs. So that's uh, that's all good. All right. Um, this should not be there. I, re I read this PowerPoint and I was like, I don't even know what it's talking about. This is the, so lactate. This is a m metabolism thing. I don't know whoever put the PowerPoint together. Um, don't worry about this, right? Lactate is, uh, yeah, just to discuss. They must have been thinking lactate, like lactation. So that this is not, uh, we are not talking about the byproduct of anaerobic glycolysis here. So typo. Discussion question. Why do the needs for carbohydrates and calories change during pregnancy? What roles do essential fatty acids and proteins play during pregnancy? So you need more of all of those. Um, so car carbohydrates spare protein needed for growth. So that's the same with everyone. Carbs spare proteins because if you don't eat carbs, your body has to make carbs. It makes carbs through a process called gluconeogenesis, uh, which uses proteins usually. So you need enough carbs to make sure you have all the protein you need for you and for growing more of you because of the pregnancy and then also growing a human being. So ideally, um, you're looking for 175 grams per day or more. Remember that the RDA for carbohydrates is normally 130, so it's jumped up to 175 during pregnancy. And then an additional 25 grams per day of protein is needed. So whatever your Excuse me. Whatever your protein intake was, so you take, you know, whether I generally recommend for physically active people, 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight of protein. Well, whatever protein is the healthy amount for you to be consuming, you add 25 grams a day during pregnancy. So your calorie needs increase uh, 340 calories per day during the second trimester and five, uh, 450 calories per day in the third trimester. You don't actually see an increase in calorie needs in the first trimester. You're not get the baby still like this. So uh, first trimester, calorie needs are the same. Second trimester, 340 more calories a day. Third trimester, 450 calories a day. Uh, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are needed for brain growth, structure, and function. I mean, you're building another human being, so you need more protein to build that human. You need the energy to build that human from carbs. 
and then you need the essential fatty acids because you're building the brain, right? Especially the omega-3 fats, and I would say especially DHA or decosahexanoic acid. Uh, the, the other omega-3 fat the, from, that we find in fish oils is called EPA, but DHA, critically important for brain health. All right, so here we see, uh, won't go through all these because you see a lot of similarities, but comparison of nutrient recommendations for non-pregnant, pregnant, and lactating females. So you see uh, a, a 24-year-old woman is the green bar, a typical one, non-pregnant, uh, what is that, tan would be pregnant, and purple would be lactating. So you notice that um, for some of the nutrients, the needs don't change during pregnancy. Uh, most of them, though, the needs do increase a little bit. Uh, you'll see that folate has, has really jumped up compared to a non-pregnant uh, woman. Uh, iron needs go way up, and you even see a note here. The increased need for iron in pregnancy cannot be met by diet or by existing stores. Therefore, iron supplements are recommended. I told you that you know those are the two, two big things you see in a prenatal vitamin. It's more folate and more iron to meet those needs. But you see iodine needs go up. Uh, we talked about that. Remember how important iodine is for the brain? Uh, if, if mom is malnourished and doesn't have enough iodine in her body uh, during pregnancy, that can lead to cretinism. You see your zinc needs do jump up quite a bit. Uh, very important for development. Um, same thing with B6. So, so almost every nutrient, you, you do see an increased need. But then look at that purple bar for lactation. So the needs get even higher, right? I told you that lactation, you, know, you, need, you need more calories and more nutrients uh, because you're producing breast milk, right? We always talk about you are what you eat. Um, but the leftover of what you eat becomes the food that you feed the baby. And that's why nutrient needs uh, stay, stay quite elevated uh, during lactation. Now, if you're actually, if you're still taking your prenatal vitamin and you're, um, and you're consuming 500 more calories a day of nutrient-dense foods, not soda or something, then you should be getting all the nutrients you need. But you see big increases in needs for vitamin A, B6, vitamin C, uh, zinc over here, manganese, iodine, chromium, all over the place. Right? So make sure you are eating plenty of nutrient-dense foods and getting plenty of calories uh, when you're pregnant and lactating. All right, nutrients for blood production and cell growth. These are going to be especially important because you're you're think about the you know the the new cells that you're building, which is which is your baby. Uh, so fetal cells are laid down at a tremendous rate. I mean, you start as a single cell and you end up as an entire human being after nine months. Uh, maternal red blood cell mass expands. We talked about that. The pounds of extra blood that are needed. Uh, so the needs for uh, the the nutrients that increase cell growth and DNA replication are really important, and that's these nutrients here. Folate we've talked about. B12 also talked about how it's, it plays a big role in cell division and differentiation. Iron and zinc. So all those are four critically important nutrients to get more of while you're pregnant and lactating. Nutrients for bone development. I mean, you're building a skeleton inside of you. So vitamin D because vitamin D is needed for calcium absorption and metabolism. So vitamin D, calcium uh, absorption and retention increase, which is good, right? That means that your body will extract more calcium from your food during pregnancy. Intake usually usually falls below recommendations. So a prenatal vitamin should hopefully ca catch that issue as well. Uh, short intervals, we, uh, we talked about this before, but short intervals between pregnancies can deplete nutrient reserves. So just remember when you're done, when you're done, growing one human being, you, it's, you see here the optimal interval is 18 to 23 months. But many many of our ancestral cultures, at least the ones I've studied, um, they generally had plans where, uh, you know, for it would be about two years between babies. Uh, and that's to make sure mom could fully recover and be really, be healthy enough to have another child. Uh, some cultures, the mo mom and dad um, slept in different beds, you know, because we know where babies come from. Uh, other, you know, and ma many cultures remember that, that uh, because of hormonal changes, lactation and breastfeeding can and function in some ways as a birth control, not a foolproof form of birth control at all, and especially less so now than ever because the average human, care, like in America especially, is carrying maybe 25 more pounds of weight, and a lot of that is fat, and that impacts hormone signaling too. So I would never trust lactation as a primary form of birth control, but it does decrease the chances that you're going to have another baby. So spacing out children is very important, and if not, if you have two, three kids in a right in a row, just imagine you, you didn't have the same nutrient reserve uh, to build that third baby as you did the first one. But you know, like my mom and her brother, they were they were Irish twins, they, which is what, I, what we call it anyways, when uh, they were born within a one year period. So it happens. All right, um, common nutrition related concerns of pregnancy. So nausea and vomiting, people, you know, morning sickness doesn't just occur in the morning, right? Uh, this could be because of hormone changes and lots of other things, but occurs at any time, not just in the morning. 
and ranges from mild queasiness to debilitating nausea and vomiting. I know, you know, my wife really struggled with this, especially with Oliver compared to the first two pregnancies. Um, you know, she was just constantly uh, using, what was it, like ginger, ginger lozenges and saltine crackers and just, yeah, she didn't feel very good. And, you know, primarily in the first trimester, but even some into the second trimester. So this can absolutely require hospitalization. I've had students that need to be hospitalized for this. If you have a lot of nausea and vomiting, that can affect hydration, right, and, and the health of the baby. So I have seen that. Uh, constipation and hemorrhoids, that just comes from, um, well, the slow GI tract, but the hemorrhoids come from abdominal pressure. So hemorrhoids are basically distended veins around the rectum and anus. So that can, th those can become real serious and very painful though. Um, heartburn, that could be, you know, the increased abdominal pressure, same thing, uh, you know, popping open the lower esophageal sphincter leading to heartburn. Uh, hormonal things can do it too. Food cravings and aversions. Most most women, when they're pregnant, uh, crave certain foods and have aversions to others, and that can even change by pregnancy. I know that you know with my wife's three pregnancies, there were different cravings with all three of them. Uh, Non-food cravings. This is also something that's quite common. Pica is the you know craving non-food substances that are usually things like clay and dirt, and that has been associated with mineral deficiencies, especially iron deficiency. It's almost like your body's craving these minerals, and that is a place where you can find them. Okay, high-risk pregnancies. So what is a high-risk pregnancy? Um, so the infant's birth weight, it would be would be one. So a, a low birth weight babies at five and a half pounds or less. We said earlier that six and a half to eight pounds is ideal. Uh, if a baby has a low birth weight, there are increased risk of complications. Relationship with socioeconomic status. I mean, you know, usually, you know, poverty, uh, increased risk of... Um, Mom being malnourished, you've got maybe maybe cigarette smoking or other things that could impact this as well, uh, other drug use. So th there are lots of things. I mean, some kids are just born small, but there are lots of things that can increase the likelihood that a child has a low birth weight. And then, uh, so gestational age. So that would be, you know, preterm babies and babies that are small for their gestational age. So that would be uh, the, the these low birth weight babies. Um, what are some, what are some, so that obviously that's that's the a real big concern is making sure the baby reaches the appropriate weight before delivery. But let's go ahead and look at some of these, um, the factors that impact high risk pregnancy. Uh, like I see like maternal diabetes and stuff like that were all really important ones. So maternal, we've talked about several before already. So maternal weight. Prior, prior to pregnancy, if, if mom has an, is, un, is either underweight or overweight or obese as classified by the BMI, all of those um, increase the risk. Uh, during pregnancy, insufficient or excessive pregnancy weight gain, we covered all that. So either you're not gaining enough weight, that pound a week during the second and third trimester, or you're gaining too much weight, both of those. So starting too light or gaining too little weight, starting too heavy, gaining too much weight, all uh, increase uh, the risk uh, factor for uh, during the pregnancy, for uh, or risks of a high-risk pregnancy. All right, previous pregnancies, see the number. So many previous pregnancies, three or more to mothers younger than the age of 20 or four or more to mothers age 20 or older. Why? As we talked about before, you're dipping into your nutrient reserves. Um, interval, short or long intervals between pregnancies, especially under 18 months, but also over 59 months. Um, outcomes, so previous history of problems. So if you've had, high, if you've had um, problems before, then of course you'd be at a higher risk for having problems again, sadly. Uh, multiple births, like twins or triplets. Uh, birth weight, so either a low or high uh, birth weight infant. We talked about we talked about that before. Maternal health, so high blood pressure puts you at an increased risk of developing gestational hypertension, which can be seri very serious. Things like preeclampsia as well. Uh, diabetes, the, uh, if you have if mom has diabetes, then the the development of gestational diabetes is much more likely. And this is why um, I think all women are screened. Their blood sugar should be screen screened between weeks 24 and 28. But if you have a high risk pregnancy, then they would screen your blood sugar um, earlier and more often. Uh, chronic diseases that can impact pregnancy, diabetes, heart, respiratory, and kidney disease, certain genetic disorders, people on special diets or medications, all these things can put you at high risk during pregnancy. Maternal nutrition, so nutritional deficiencies or toxicities and eating disorders or disordered eating patterns, all of those increase the risk of the pregnancy. Socioeconomic status, poverty, lack of family support, low level of education, limited food availability, all things would increase risk of malnutrition, poor diet, etc. Lifestyle habits, smoking, alcohol, drug use, and then age, either um, 15 years or younger or 35 years or older. So being, so being young comes with some risks and being old comes with some older, sorry, comes with some risk as well. We'll come back and talk about that a little bit more later. 
Uh, malnutrition in pregnancy, so malnutrition's effects on fertility, we talked about that before. If you're malnourished, um, you're less likely to have healthy, viable sperm. You're less likely to have a high enough sperm count to, to actually um, lead to pregnant conception. Um, can if can if, uh, loss of sexual interest can lead lead to libido so, uh, loss of libido so if someone is malnourished really low body fat they often will have no interest in sex which which again makes sense if you're uh, preparing for a body build you know uh, bodybuilding competition and you're five percent body body fat your body is thinking that you're starving to death so your libido goes away uh, because if you're if you can't find food for yourself you should not be reproducing right that's why weight loss low body fat these things can lead to a loss of libido and loss of sexual interest uh, the friends I have that are bodybuilders when they get near competition prep they have no interest in sex and, and probably couldn't get an erection if they wanted to uh, at least not as often as they'd want to so malnutrition impacts sperm impacts libido and then we talked about all the things it does in females as well um, early pregnancy, so it prevents the placenta from fully developing uh, fully because, you know, with malnutrition. And then fetal development, you, you need building blocks to build a human being. And if you don't have them, there can be a price to pay. We've talked about neural tube defects and others, bone health, etc. All right, so how do we how do we prevent this malnutrition that that can be associated with low social economic status and poverty, etc.? Uh, so we have food assistance programs like WIC, Women, Infants, and Children, uh, nutrition education and nutritious foods uh, given to vulnerable populations uh, uh, who qualify for help. All, all great stuff. Uh, the cost benefit analysis. I mean, I, I think it's great. I mean, I think that uh, we talked about before. Helping the next generation can have an impact forever, right? You can change the trajectory of a child's life. So if a, if a kid is get is given more nutritious food, then they are more likely to um, improve their own status in life as they get older, and that's all great. Uh, remedial and preventative services, incentives to encourage breastfeeding, so all, I think all good news. Uh, effects of particular foods may alter breast milk flavor and then can impact things like allergies, so just all stuff to keep in mind. Uh, you know, I recommend not having super spicy food and things like that when you're when you're lactating. Uh, breast milk provides immunological protection, so we, we can talk a little bit more about that. But um, uh, so the two main reasons that I that I love breast milk is that uh, well, for nutrition, you know, or nutrition and microbiological reasons for babies, not me personally. Sorry, it might have sounded weird. Is that uh, you know, so breast milk has all five classes of antibodies, meaning that you know, IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE, and IgD. So basically. Babies getting dosed with an immunotherapy every time they're being breastfed. Mom's exposed to the same environment as her child. Mom's immune system, so the baby's immune system is underdeveloped. Mom's supposed to cut, fill in the gaps and cover them because mom's exposed to the same thing. Mom's immune system recognizes the environment and makes antibodies and then doses the baby every time they're being breath, breastfed. So that's what it means when it says breast milk provides immunological protection. But then on top of that, breast milk, human breast milk has over 200 HMOs, which are human and milk oligosaccharides. They're called prebiotics. They're fibers that feed the microbiome in your gut. So not only is your immune system System benefiting from breast milk, but so is your microbiome. And, and breast milk is actually a probiotic food too. So it has living organisms, plus it has food for those organisms to help your uh, microbiome develop. So, so those are the two main reasons. I mean, you can you can get formula that has the vitamins and minerals and fatty acids you need. But if you were to ask me, what are the two reasons um, why breast milk is superior? Um, those would be the two big ones: the immunity aspect and the development of the microbiome for sure. All right, women with HIV should not breastfeed. That's because um, HIV can cross into breast milk. It also can cross the placenta. All right, so so infant formula, you know, if if some infant formula is available, then if you have HIV, you should definitely not be breastfeeding. But you know, it's is it that or starve the baby? Then then you'd still want to breastfeed. All right, maternal health. Um, talked about a lot of these things already. Pre-existing diabetes puts you at high risk, so that's why they would test your blood sugar earlier and more often, hopefully. They wouldn't wait until uh, week, weeks 24 to 28 to screen your blood sugar because you're at much higher risk. Gestational diabetes, which, which is diabetes that occurs during pregnancy and then should go away. Uh, complications during labor and delivery due to the high birth weight. So if you have gestational diabetes, the baby's more likely to be uh, very large. Chronic hypertension, so already having high blood pressure is going to have an impact on, on baby's health and mom's health. And then gestational hypertension can develop and can become a life-threatening condition called preeclampsia, which has effects to the mom's circulatory system, liver, the kidneys are real important there, and the brain. And the brain. Preeclampsia can lead to eclampsia, which can lead to seizures, coma, and death. So no joke. Monitoring your blood sugar and your blood pressure during pregnancy, super, super important.
All right, age of the mom. So physically ideal childbearing age, they say here is 20 to 25. So if you're under 20, especially we said earlier under 15. So adolescents, risks of pregnancy complications, higher rates of stillbirths, preterm births, low birth weight infants. Again, that's whether that's because of um, the age of the mom or the, you, the bottom here, need for economic, social, physical support, these kind of things. Uh, so they need to seek prenatal care. So it's, I don't know if it's a cause or an effect. I don't know if it's just that adolescents are more likely to be malnourished or more likely to you know, have low, lower socioeconomic status. I don't know. But, um, but the younger you are, uh, the higher risk of the, of the pregnancy. And then on the other end too, so pregnancy in older women, uh, first births to those that are 35 and older, uh, higher maternal death rates, so harder on the mom, uh, because of underlying chronic conditions like hypertension and diabetes. Uh, infants also face potential problems. A lot of that is genetic. So Down syndrome is much more common. You'll see some numbers here in just a moment. Uh, you can pause and try to answer these. Complications with later childbearing is often due to chronic conditions like diabetes and hypertension. Cesarean deliveries are twice as likely in women over the age of 35. Uh, one in 50, so this is a big deal, one in 50 pregnancies in older women produces an infant with genetic abnormalities. So you see here, maternal death rates are higher in women over 35. Risk of Down syndrome goes uh, is one in 100 for a 40-year-old woman compared to one in 10,000 for a 20-year-old woman. It, just ha it has to do with just the, the health of the genetic material in, in someone that's uh, 40 years old versus 20. All right, practices, just about done here, practices that are incompatible with pregnancy. Alcohol consumption can lead to irreversible mental and physical retardation. It's called fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, medicinal drugs, that's why you always gotta work with your doctor with drugs. You know, um, decide which, uh, drugs are classified by whether or not they're safe during pregnancy. And then if you're, if you're on a drug that puts your pregnancy at high risk, you have to decide if it's worth getting pregnant, uh, getting off the drug, et cetera, et cetera. Work with your doctor on that kind of stuff. Um, herbal supplements, seek physician's advice just because, again, better safe than sorry when you're pregnant. Uh, an, er an herb that might be completely safe to take when you're not pregnant is questionable at best when pregnant. So always uh, work with your doctor on that. Um, illicit drug use, obviously, um, can lead to all sorts of problems. Other dangerous practices, uh, smoking and chewing tobacco, harmful effects are magnified during pregnancy. And we talked about secondhand smoke or smoking and increased risk, of, or not the baby wouldn't smoke, but um, secondhand smoke for babies seems to increase the risk of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, environmental contaminants, we, call, we talked about this in an earlier chapter, things like um, lead and mercury. Lead, they both can have an, uh, a permanent impact on the developing nerv nervous system. So minimizing exposure to lead and mercury is a really great idea. Um, eating fish is really good, but if you're pregnant, you know, making sure it's fi fish that are super low in mercury, super low in toxins. You have to be real smart about your seafood choices when you're pregnant and, um, and for your children. Um, Foodborne illnesses, so there are there are a group of infections called torch infections that can cross the placenta, and then mom is also a, a bit immunocompromised or, or has a suppressed immune system during pregnancy, which makes sense because a baby's growing inside of them that is ha only half them, so it's a foreign invader. There's a parasite living inside of your uterus, and um, so the immune system is basically suppressed. Now this can actually, if mom has autoimmune conditions, they can actually get better during pregnancy because of this. But um, so you have, so mom, a, pre a pregnant woman is at increased risk of certain infections. Uh, so a big one here, you see an increased risk of listeriosis. You can get that from like deli meats and fish. So again, being very, very careful about your food choices. Another one is, you know, uh, pregnant women need to avoid kitty litter or cat poop because of uh, toxoplasmosis infections. So those are a couple things. Uh, and then there's a whole list of these infections that can cross the placenta. They're called torch infections. Okay, um, other risky behaviors. Vitamin and mineral megadoses, so excessive vitamin A is a big one, can cause fetal malformations and spontaneous abortion, those kind of things. So making sure you're not getting you know, toxic levels of nutrients is just as important as not having deficiencies. Uh, caffeine, high intakes, risk of miscarriage and fetal death, low intakes appear safe, so you and your doctor figure out what low versus high intake means, I guess. Um, restrictive dieting, I don't think that um, during pregnancy is really a time to be doing any sort of restrictive dieting. But you see here as an example, um, low carb diets can deprive the fetal brain of needed glucose. So I, you know, I'm a big fan of low carb diets, diets for lots of people for lots of reasons. But when you're pregnant, you need to focus on what's the the healthiest thing for the baby. Um, sugar substitutes again, it just depend. You know what. Um, you have to work with your doctor on those kind of things. What is safe and what's not safe. All right, nutrition, so now we've had the baby. Nutrition during lactation. 
to the benefits of breast, breast milk I've talked about quite a bit already. So nutritionally, it can be really, really good. Uh, there are situations though, where if mom's malnourished or mom has a real toxic burden in her body, that might not be the, you know, the, it might not always be the right thing to do, but generally speaking, it's that you get the right nutrients in the right levels. Um, if you are breastfeeding, they generally recommend um, supplementing with vitamin D though. But uh, so nutrient, the correct nutritional composition, nutrients are bioavailable. Um, yeah, and then it's just, of course, some um, hormones, uh, basically uh, prolactin is what's leading to the development of the mammary glands, the production of breast milk, and then the hormone oxytocin. It, that should be milk production, not mild production, but oxytocin is what causes the ejection of, of milk. And they both say mild there, but they should both say, say milk. So, so oxytocin and prolactin are the two key hormones there. But I've mentioned earlier, not just nutritional composition, but um, the immunity that comes from breast milk and then the development of the microbiome are two really big ones. So what are some of the benefits of breastfeeding? For infants, provides the appropriate composition and balance of nutrients with high bioavailability, so nutrients that are designed for the baby. Provides hormones that promote physiological development, absolutely, like oxytocin is a pair bonding molecule. Protects against a variety of infections and illnesses, including diarrhea and ear infections, which all great. May protect against some chronic diseases later in life, including diabetes, obesity, and asthma. I think that has to do with the microbiome component more than anything. Protects against food allergies, reduces the risk of SIDS, and supports a healthy weight. So all great things. Uh, for mothers, it contracts the uterus, helping the uterus return to its closer to its normal size and decreasing infection risk. Uh, delays the return of regular ovulation, thus lengthening birth intervals. We talked, again, we, I, I mentioned all this before. It's not a, a, a dependable method of contraception, but it does generally help. So I can space out the babies at least 18 months as recommended. Conserves iron stores by prolonging amenorrhea or the absence of the menstrual cycle. May protect against breast and ovarian cancer and reduce the risk of type two diabetes, hypertension and heart disease, all interesting. But I think that, I think a lot of that is linked to the next point, increased energy expenditure, which may help bring about weight loss or helping you return to your pre-pregnancy weight. So pretty cool stuff there. Other uh, cost and time savings from not needing medical treatments for childhood illnesses or leaving work to care for sick infants. I mean, yeah, that could be a positive. I mean, it is a positive, it's true, but not always guaranteed, right? Uh, cost and time savings from not needing to purchase and prepare formula, even after adjusting for added foods in the diet of a lactating mom, because she has to consume 500 more calories, but it can still be a cost and time saving. Again, could be. Um, my son Oliver, he never latched, so my wife would basically spend 30 minutes pumping and then 30 minutes feeding him, and then it was about time to start over again. So I would not say that there was a cost or a time savings for, for us in our situation. Environmental savings to society from not needing to manufacture, package, and ship formula and dispose of the packaging. Sadly, right now, there are formula shortages, so this is even more true than ever. And the convenience of not having to shop for and prepare formula. So you see here at the bottom, and that, I don't know where the number comes from, but an estimated savings of twelve to $1,500 in the first year. Maternal energy and nutrient needs during lactation. We talked about nutrient needs before. Uh, fi almost 500 calories extra a day. Um, exercise is compatible with breastfeeding, but you have to make up for the exercise calories. Energy needs, uh, recommendations, increases for carbs and fiber. N uh, nut nutrient inadequacies reduce the quantity, not the quality of breast milk. So generally, again, baby's gonna get what they need. So mom's gonna pour whatever nutrients she has available into breast milk, but the quantity of breast milk will go down if mom is malnourished. Uh, total water intake, that's 3.8 liters per day. That's about uh, 13 cups. 13 cups of water per day, I think, is what, what's recommended during lactation. Minimum number of calories that I've ever seen is 1,800 uh, when lactating, but of course, scale that to whatever your needs are. All right, nursing offers immunological protection. We talked about that uh, because all, all different types of antibodies are given to the baby, and then uh, breast milk is also a, um, a probiotic and a prebiotic food. Um, HIV infection and AIDS can be transmitted through breast milk, so keep that in mind. Uh, diabetes requires careful monitoring because if mom's blood sugar is all over the place, that can have a, a negative impact. Uh, postpartum amenorrhea is prolonged, but women are not protected from pregnancy. So I think, an I think our ancestors would have been more protected, but the fact that we carry so much extra body fat around, a typical person anyways, kind of negates some of that. But it is, So it's kind of like a, a decent form of birth control, but not, not extremely effective. Uh, breast health, in, in, increased breast health, breast health bre decreased breast cancer risk. We talked about that. And then the links with postpartum depression. Nursing helping with that. All right, what practices are incompatible with lactation? Alcohol, because it, it crosses into breast milk. 
Um, infants eat less when mothers consume alcohol. You shouldn't be consuming alcohol. Uh, medicinal drugs, work with your doctor on those kind of things. Um, all sorts of illicit drugs put, put mom and baby at risk. Smoking we've talked about, environmental contaminants like lead and mercury we've talked about, and caffeine we've talked about. So I think we've hit all that. These are all things that should be avoided for the health of uh, during pregnancy and during lactation. Okay, we did it. Uh, great, you know, a uh, great chapter, I think. Obviously, an important, important period of life because it sets you up for the rest of your life. Now the lesson is over, you should have learned to list the ways men and women can prepare for a healthy pregnancy. We've done that. Describe fetal development from conception to birth and explain how maternal malnutrition can affect critical periods. We covered those. Explain how both underweight and overweight can interfere with a healthy pregnancy and how weight gain and physical activity can support maternal health and infant growth. That was what we spent most of our time talking about. Summarize the nutrient needs of women during pregnancy. I showed you that chart. Identify factors predicting low risk and high risk pregnancies and describe ways to manage them. Talked about all that. Age, diabetes, hypertension, etc. Summarize the nutrient needs of women during lactation. So we did it. All right. Good chapter. Uh, now, we'll, now we'll look at taking care of the infant moving on in our next section uh, on the nutrition across the lifespan. So I hope this helps. Have a wonderful day. Be blessed.